Welcome and thanks for joining us. We know you have a lot of things that you can watch on your screens and we're really glad that you chose to join us at the HRG for our Distinguished Speaker Series. Tonight, we're really excited to bring you Eric Lamming and his talk, Stop Resisting, Understanding Police Use of Force and Accountability in Canada. Before we get started, we want to acknowledge that we are gathering tonight on the traditional territory of the Adirondack. Ojibwe, Adawa, Potawatomi, and Wyandotte Nations. And we also want to acknowledge that our speaker tonight is a member of the Shabbat Abajawan First Nation. So the format for tonight is a talk and it will be followed by an audience Q&A. We have a special guest introducer tonight and he's gonna throw the first question to Eric. Uh, and after that, we're gonna open it up to all of you. And before we go to the audience Q&A, because that's such an important part of what we do at the HRG, we're gonna bring on crowd favorite Crystal Bryan to explain to you uh, anybody who's new or a reminder about how you can ask questions which is by text in the Q&A. If you see the Q&A tab, you can actually en enter your text question at any point during the talk. We'll get to it in the Q&A at the end. Or you can also come on the screen if you raise your hand and Chris will explain how to do that. So let's get into it. Uh, one great thing about having our distinguished speakers come from away is we also get to uh, bring in a special expert guest from our community or from the university. And tonight I'm really pleased to introduce Dr. John Dukmedjian Duke Med, Duke uh, to introduce and ask the first question. Uh, he is a PhD in criminology from the Center of Criminology at the University of Toronto. So he shares that in common with Eric Lamming. He has researched and published on community policing, child protection, intelligence-led policing, national security intelligence, surveillance, and neoliberal governments. Prior to his work at the University of Windsor, he worked for the Director of National Ethics under the supervision of the Department of Justice and the Commissioner's Office of the RCMP. He has a forthcoming publication, which will be out this year from Bristol University Press. It's a chapter and it's called, the bad guys are everywhere, the good guys are somewhere, parsing pre-crime and the role of national security intelligence in an age of mass surveillance. So with that, I'm going to give it over to Dr. Duke Medjian. Uh, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction, Kim. And uh, thank you to the HRG group and Crystal uh, for putting this wonderful talk together. We do have a terrific guest with us, uh, Eric Laming. We, I just uh, had a quick discussion with Eric um, about his talk, and it's going to be extremely fascinating, especially given uh, the last year we've seen a uh, tremendous unrest, civil unrest uh, associated with uh, the indiscriminate use of violence by police officers and um, understanding uh, the uh, issues surrounding the use of force, um, in, including uh, sort of um, what um, kinds of accountability structures uh, that are in place or not in place, uh, as the case might or might not be, um, oversight bodies, etc. Uh, throughout Canada. And um, I believe uh, Eric, if he gets around to it, is also going to discuss body-worn cameras, which is also a timely issue that uh, we've been um, mulling around for quite some time um, to see if they have impacts on um, police accountability. So uh, with that brief introduction said, uh, I'd like to welcome Eric Lamming and um, really look forward to your talk, Eric. All right, well, yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight. And thank you, John, for that nice introduction. I appreciate that. And thank you to Kim and HRG. Uh, it's uh, great to be here and virtually anyway. Uh, but yeah, there's a lot to get through on this topic. Uh, generally, there's three main components that I want to talk about tonight. Uh, the first is going to just generally, generally talk about police use of force data and kind of what that looks like, understanding what it is, understanding issues around that. And then that will kind of segue into 
police accountability and what does police accountability, accountability look like throughout Canada, in Ontario specifically, uh, what are some of the problems that we have with police accountability systems, police oversight bodies, and then hopefully there'll be enough time to talk about an accountability reform in terms of body cameras. And this is something that's gonna be kind of highlighting into the, into the future of policing. And so it's important to talk about it and it's important to clear up any misperceptions or things that the public might not know too much about or they're just not informed on the topic. I hope to kind of clarify some of those issues. And then whatever I don't cover or I don't get into too much detail, I, I, I'm more than happy to talk about it during the question period. Um, but first, I mean, to get into it, police use force data. I mean, first off, when, when you think about police use force, I mean, what do you think about, right? It can mean something different to everyone. And something that I talk about to community members who are interview, uh, especially Indigenous and Black community members, I always ask them the question and their responses vary quite, quite considerably. Um, a lot of them talk about excessive use of force. I mean, that's something that we always tend to think about or gravitate to when we, we watch media, uh, anything, any stories that come out uh, about police use of force issues, it's always about excessive use of force. But just peeling everything back and just looking at general use of force, I mean, it's such a large topic, but in research and in, in academic literature, it's such, such a hard thing to define and then measure. So in different types of research, you're going to get uh, academics or researchers explaining use of force one way when you're going to get somebody explaining it a different way and then measuring it diff a different way. So it's really hard to come up with a true baseline or, or rate of use of force and how often it occurs. I mean, we always want to understand how often does police use of force occur in our communities. Something that's problematic with that is uh, for in terms of transparency, um, police services do collect this information. They do some of them report it. Some of them don't. It really depends on, on the agency and it really depends on the province or territory where the police service is located and what legislation kind of dictates uh, in terms of reporting. I can tell you in, in Ontario, uh, since that's a major focus of my research, is that police use of force statistics are really hard to come by. You're going to get mainly aggregated statistics, so summary statistics in the sense of you know, the number of use of force cases a year. That's a that's pretty much basic information that we're going to get, but it's not consistent across uh, many jurisdictions in, in, in Ontario. We have about 46 police services plus the OPP. So it's a lot of police service, a lot of coverage. It's a lot of interactions with the public. So in terms of how use of force is documented, you generally officers, if they use force in their, in their duties, they got to fill out a report, okay? Now, something that's always interesting about this is that when you're filling out a report, if you use a taser, which is a conducted energy weapon, if you use your gun, if you use physical force that results in an injury that needs medical medical attention, you need to fill out a use of force report uh, from the police officer's perspective. But if you use physical force and it doesn't result in an, an injury that requires medical attention, you do not need to fill out a report. Some services might do that. It really depends on their local policies, but in terms of the Ontario legislation, they don't need to do it. So that's a problem we have right there because how many cases are we missing? How many cases go un un unaccounted for? And I can tell you based off a lot of, a lot of the inter interviews that I conduct with community members, that's a lot of their personal experiences and vicarious experiences. They, that's the, kind of the use of force that's used on them in the, in, in the course of their lifetime has been physical types of force, hitting, punching, kneeing, um, you know, roughing up elbows to, the, to their face, neck, body. Those types of physical force, <clears throat> it didn't result in an injury that they, that they told me and it didn't require medical attention or they didn't, just, it didn't go to medical attention from that. Uh, so officers technically do not have to fill out a use of force report in those cases. So it's, it's unclear how often use of force happens. Something that also complicates this is if we look at how use of force is reported publicly, okay? So if you, to give you an example, I'll, I'll talk about Windsor, okay? If most people are from, from the area, hopefully. Um, in, in Windsor, the, they come out with annual reports every year, okay? Sometimes they will release use of force statistics in the annual reports to dictate you know, what, what's happening in the community. Windsor hasn't. Uh, a lot of police services don't report use of force numbers in their annual reports. I don't know why. Um, it's something that should, it's public information. Um, it, it, where you're gonna have to go fishing for some of these use of force statistics. And usually you'll find it in police board minute meetings, meeting minutes. Um, and it could be like deep down, like 50 pages into a report that you'll find use of force statistics. statistics. So in terms of Windsor, in 2019, the, the most updated uh, statistics on use of force, they reported 226 use of force incidents, okay? Now, it's, con it's a complex issue because even within this reporting, you're going to have multiple reports, okay? So 
they re- they only report the number of incidents. They don't report the number of reports publicly. Okay, so you could have two officers who go to the same incident. They both use force. They have to fill out a, a, report, a report each. Okay, so you're going to have more reports than you're going to have incidents. Within that, you're going to have more occurrences than you're going to have reports and incidents. Occurrences would be maybe four different use of force options in one incident. So if I'm a police officer and I uh, use physical force and then I use my pepper spray and then I use my taser, that's three different occurrences in one use of force incident. So you're going to have use of force happens much more than what it's reported, but we only know kind of just the baseline of, of the incidents that's being reported. And then something that the police always, always report on is how often does use of force occur when you compare it to calls for service? Okay. We always get that number and the rates that we usually get are so low. They're very low. And here's the caveat. Uh, police use of force is rare. And I should have probably started with that. Um, it, it's rare in the grand scheme of everything, all the interactions with, with, community members and police, it doesn't happen often. In the U.S., you'll see numbers around, you know, police use of force occurs in less than 2% of all police civilian encounters. That's something that you have to obviously peel back and kind of look at that critically, because what does that mean? How is use of force being defined? How is use of force being reported? And how is police civilian encounters being captured in that, okay? So in terms of the Canadian jurisdictions, they'll always report use of force beside the calls for service, okay? So Windsor had 226 incidents of use of force. They had a little over 225,000 calls for service in 2019. So when you divide that number, I mean, you have the numerator as use of force, you have your denominator as police civilian interactions, you come out to like a 0.018% of uh, use of force occurrences. So that's the rate, very low, very, very low. Now, that's might not be the best number to compare. It's obviously important to publicly report that, but you want to know what about arrest? If you want to divide the number of use of force cases, interactions during arrest, it's probably a better number to look at because that's usually when use of force is going to be necessitated. Um, if you look at 125,000 calls for service, generally 75 to 80 percent of those calls are non-urgent, non-emergency responses that would never necessitate a use of force. Okay, uh, people will call the police for everything. I mean, they do so much. Okay, I mean, their roles have expanded so much over the past uh, couple of decades that police uh, will have to go to you know a traffic light being out and dictate traffic, that's a calls for service. That's not gonna necessitate a use of force unless somebody gets out of the car and starts badgering the police and you know, can lead to something. Obviously every interaction has a potential to, to do that, but in, in general, most cases would never necessitate use of force. So we have to look at these numbers with a lot of different lenses. And that's something that's always interesting. It's probably not the best to always report that publicly that these are the two numbers that we, we are comparing because it's not an accurate portrayal of use of force, okay? Going further, now, if I asked everyone who's watching and listening in, if you could tell me how many times the police shot at somebody in 2020, or how many times the police killed somebody in 2020, uh, a lethal force, so using their firearm, I'm sure you'd have a really hard time telling me that answer because it doesn't exist. Nothing like that exists. And that's something that it always boggles my mind. It's boggled my mind for you know, over a decade of the work that I put into this. It's just that that information doesn't exist. It's crazy. I mean, you can go to, you can look online, you can find how many Big Macs were sold at McDonald's this past year, but you, but you can't, you, you can go further. You can look at how many people who work for the public sector in Ontario make over hundred thousand dollars. It's a really nice database that you can look at. Right. But in terms of people shooting police state agents, shooting their guns at members of the public, you can't find a nice table that shows you how many times that happens. Uh, and it's, it's, it's crazy. I don't, I don't know how that doesn't exist. Uh, we have obviously some issues with our provincial and territorial governments that that doesn't exist because, you know, they, they collect so many statistics on everything, but that's something that either has to be reported by independent researchers, or, you know, if the media wants to look into it, they will. And they have in, in the past. Um, in my research, I keep a, a database on lethal force. And here's the thing, because the use of force is so complex, I have to categorize uh, lethal force as when an officer fires their gun at someone. That's technically that in my my research and in my conceptualization of use of force or lethal force, that's what it means to me. Because when an officer pulls out their gun and shoots at somebody, that's the intent to kill. It has the capacity to kill. So I include all these numbers in my database. And over the past four years that I, I've been collecting this, and it's a lot of information to go into a database, it's the trends are pretty similar. I mean, we have about 66 on average police shootings every year, not police shooting deaths. Uh, usually around 30 is the average of people who are shot and killed by police in Canada every year. Um, it's not high. I mean, it's low, but the, I mean, it's still 
a number that we have to pay attention to. We have to have a discussion about. And the fact that this is just my database, who knows how many cases that I'm not finding that that exist out there. Uh, I would hope that my database is, is okay and it's got a lot of good information in it, but who knows? I mean, uh, the Canadian press did a story in, in December and they were doing this, trying to find how many times uh, somebody was shot by police in 2020. They asked, you know, I collaborated with them on the project and they, they even came to me and they were missing three or four notable cases that I know about off the top of my head that they didn't find in, in their in their research of this. So that just goes to show you, you have people that it's just really hard to find information. And going beyond that, I mean, there's even some services who don't fall under certain police legislation, such as First Nations Police Services in Ontario. Generally, they're better equipped to deal with, with issues in their communities and they're better better police service in terms of community policing, for sure. And I have great admiration for uh, First Nations police services and First Nations police officers. Uh, but there, I mean, this stuff does happen on certain reserves. And there is a police shooting with the largest uh, First Nations police service uh, last year. But it's not reported because it's not investigated by an oversight body, and a civilian oversight body. So you really have to be looking for this information to find it. And that's something that's always concerning. And the CBC did do something like this. They did create a, a database on deadly encounters between the public and the police uh, in 2017. And it, it captured data from 2000, 2000 to 2017. Then they updated just this past year after the, the George Floyd incident. And it is telling, I mean, the database that they have, is, it's, it's good. It gives you kind of a snapshot into the types of encounters police have with the public that result in death. But I, I have issues with the database and I, I don't, obviously I'm stuck with time, so I'm not gonna go too much detail, but it's, it's misleading somewhat to the public because they include cases where somebody dies from an overdose during a police, like they're arrested, okay, but they died from an overdose, and that was determined by the coroner and independent investigative agency. So technically, I mean, the police didn't kill them. Sure, it's a deadly encounter, but it's it's over almost overestimating the number of times police kill somebody, and that's kind of misleading to the public. So there's a lot of problems. You always have to look at these databases, look at how everything's being conceptualized, defined, operationalized within these uh kind of these statistics that are being gathered and make a better determination and inter interpret that. I mean, we do need better public education in terms of telling the public how often police use force and what goes into it. But that's that. I mean, that's, it's a very complex topic, but it segues into police accountability and what happens when police shoot somebody? What happens when police seriously injure somebody? Well, we do have accountability structures throughout Canada not consistent. There's problems with our accountability system. Okay. And, and generally, I mean, the police are doing a great job. Okay. I, we, we should give them credit where credit is due, but there are issues when, you know, there's a police shooting or there's a, a serious injury that shouldn't be investigated by police. All right. So we have seven provinces right now that have an oversight body who looks into or investigates or has a mandate to investigate serious incidents and in, in death caused by police. So Ontario, we've had the longest one for out of all of the seven provinces. Uh, we have the SIU, so the Special Investigations Unit. Um, I'm sure many people have heard of this body before. Not very popular with, uh, with a lot of the public uh, going through the last few years. Uh, there has been issues. Uh, people that I talk to in my research also kind of, on the one hand, they don't even know some of these bodies exist. On the other hand, they, the, the ones that they do know exist think that they're really bad um, and, and, and ineffective at what they do. So clearly there's, there's a big divide. There's a big disconnect between kind of what is there and what is supposed to be working in that sense. So in terms of when an officer shoots somebody, you're going to have the SIU that comes in. It's an independent investigative agency. They're a civilian oversight body, and they will do an investigation. Okay, So it's in a sense, it's independent. But when you scale it back a little bit, who are the investigators? What's their background? Uh, do they have biases? Who knows? We have to look into that, right? In terms of the SIU, I can tell you there's over 50 investigators with the SIU. And um, I believe there's over 40 investigators who have a former police background. Okay, so they're either a former police officer or they worked for their forensic uh, investigative teams within police services. So they have a police background. A lot of people do not like that. A lot of people think that once you're a police officer, you're always going to have those, those biases and, and it plays into the investigations. So there's different ways to kind of, I guess, a safeguard in place for those inst instances. If, if there's a police officer who, who, a former police officer who's an investigator, they can't investigate their, their former police service. So, I mean, there are things in legislation that, that at least provide safeguards in that sense. 
But in terms of these oversight bodies, how effective are they? People will always look to charge rates, okay? And I can tell you charge rates are quite low, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're ineffective at what they do. Conversely, what it might mean is that we have a proper investigation and the actual police, police officers were justified in doing what, what they did, okay? Under law, they were justified in, do, in, in, in using the, the force that they used or whatever they had, they had to do in that interaction. So technically, by that standard, they're doing their job properly. And it's going to, I mean, it's going to anger a lot of the public when those cases come out and those investigations deem that an officer was justified in, in doing what they were doing. So you're always going to have a disconnect because of, of this misperception of what goes into these investigations. Sure, there's tons of problems with oversight bodies. And, and just off the top of my head, I can name uh, like at least four major issues. One is there's a lack of transparency. And historically, there's always been a lack of transparency with these bodies. For example, the BEI um, in Quebec is the oversight body. I would pronounce the full name, but I don't want to uh, impress too many people with my French. But they are... Uh, They've been around since 2016, and they've had such a, a kind of a culture of secrecy that goes on with the agency. They don't release reports. They rarely give to immediate updates. And, and most of all, I mean, they, they don't have their diversity of the investigators is just it's, it's not there at all. Um, that's a second issue. Uh, if you look at a lot of the investigators for these agencies, they're, I mean, there's not that widespread diversity for them and they will come out they'll be the first ones to say yeah we do have a problem in that aspect so when you have a an indigenous person who's shot and killed by the police uh and then you have uh investigators who go into these communities you're gonna have a hard time gaining that trust from the community members to come forward to talk to you and then trying to build that connection and really get to the get to the bottom of what happened it's going to be difficult and it's you know you don't have those lived experiences as well so it's going to be even more difficult to to kind of when that decision has to come out and it's deemed that it's justified i mean you're not going to win trust from the community so diversity is an important part of improving uh, these accountability bodies. Another one is a lack of authority. Some of these bodies don't even have the power to lead charges, okay? So if we're, if we're giving the state agency a power to investigate police, but we're not giving them the power to lay charges in criminal matters if they believe that a criminal offense was committed, that could be problematic. And we do have two, currently two of those bodies in one in BCs, the Independent Investigations Office, as well as the Quebec body, they don't have the power to lay charges. So they're very limited and something that kind of you know, more gravity of the situation is that the, the IIO and BBC has come out in the last uh, couple of years with 20 charges that they believe should be charges for officers. They send it to the crown. Okay. And the crown comes back and says, you know what, five and six of these, I don't like, I don't like them. They're not, we can't get a conviction out of this. So they're dropped. So there's a big disconnect even between the prosecution and the oversight body who are investigating the, the police officers. So if you don't have that authority or that independence to lay criminal charges, you're already limited. You're already kind of behind that eight ball in, in the powers that you're trying to convey to the public and what you do. And then obviously there's issues with uh, just a lack of reporting to the public and a lack of race-based data. That's something that I, I didn't even mention when I was talking about use of force data. We don't have race-based data to begin with. In Ontario, the, the Ontario police have just been uh, mandated in 2020 to start collecting race-based data during use of force incidents. It's their perception of the use of force incident, okay? So they have to, when they go into a case, if they believe that the person was black or if they believe the person was Hispanic, they mark that as their perception of the race, okay? So we are gonna have some data in the future. It's gonna take time to kind of build a database in that sense, even though we don't have a great database, but in the sense of race-based data, it's non-existent across Canada because police just haven't been actively reporting that for their existence. And even if they do report it, even they, if they do document it, it's not reported publicly. It's hard to get any access to that. So it's in, in terms of patterns, trends, it's really difficult to understand police use of force in, in in just general, um, it, there's all these other personal characteristics that need to be collected as well. What about sexual orientation, mental health status, age, gender, all of these factors, all these personal characteristics play into use of force cases, and it will allow us to identify problems that are going on within communities. I mean, that's the best way that we can identify those trends and kind of overcome the systemic racism that we've been having, right? So that's a, something that we need to work at. And in terms of oversight bodies, accountability mechanisms are, are there, but in terms of reporting, it's not there. The SIU just uh, have been mandated in, in October of 2020 to start collecting race-based data. It's beyond me that they haven't been collecting this from the start. And I can tell you that my, my research, I've looked at SIU cases, I've got access to these SIU cases. It's there, the race of the individual and all the other personal characteristics 
it, it's there. It's been there since the start. It's been there since 1990 because it's in police reports. It's in narratives. It's in uh, arrest reports, general occurrence reports, not use of force reports, but it's in reports uh, as part of the SIU investigation. So they could have been collectively, or they could have been actively collecting this information, but they haven't been. And they're only doing it now when they come out publicly to say, oh, we're doing this now, you know, to because we're, we want to be part of the, this change. No, they're doing it because the Anti-Racism Act of 2017 in Ontario dictates that they have to do that. And they had to start doing it in, in October of 2020. So it's just, it's beyond me why these oversight bodies who have a great deal of information, a great deal of data from these police use of force cases, haven't been collecting this information. It's just, I don't understand, but it's something that hopefully with enough pressure, with enough public kind of uh, activism in that sense, we will see that uh, across all these jurisdictions. But we also have to get oversight bodies across all these jurisdictions too. There's tons of them that don't even have it. Saskatchewan, uh, none of it, all the territories, Northern Territories, Yukon, a few out east. These locations don't have a civilian oversight body that investigates serious incidents between the police and the public. In those cases, you're going to have the police doing the investigation. You're going to have a different oversight body maybe coming in. You're going to have uh, a, a contracted oversight body come in. So each province, each territory needs to have their own uh, police civilian agency uh, that looks into serious cases involving the police and the public and maybe expanding their mandate to look at all cases involving, you know, use of force cases, all serious cases, uh, because the the incidents that these oversight bodies investigate are, are the the tip of the iceberg. It's the 10% of cases that, that actually occur out there in the field. It's the most serious cases, but it's, it's a very limited number of how many use of force cases occur every year. So that's something that, you know, we need to have more of a discussion about going forward and improving police oversight um, because we already have a high standard for police officers anyway, and a high standard of oversight, but there's problems within these accountability mechanisms that limit this and kind of stagnate going forward. And then the last thing I'm going to get to, because uh, I don't have too much time left, and hopefully some of this will come out in, in the question and answer, uh, but body cameras. So a lot of people think body cameras are going to be kind of a cure-all. They think it's going to be the, the panacea of, of change, of you know making things better. And I can tell you, based off research, it is not going to do that. Uh, it's going to help in some cases, okay? But you know, why do we think it's going to just improve things all of a sudden for all these different community members and you know the relationships between police and the public? Well, it's a lot of it's rhetoric. A lot of it is based on emotion. It's uh, political leaders telling us that all these things are going to make a the body cameras are going to make everything better. We always hear. I mean, even our highest person and, and Prime Minister Trudeau and everyone below claiming that body cameras are necessary, they're going to improve transparency, they're going to improve accountability, and, and just everyone's going to love these, these devices. There's no evidence in the research that suggests that body cameras are going to do anything that, that these politicians and other leaders are telling us they're going to do. And as a matter of fact, in Canada, it, it might not do anything in terms of transparency, because think about it, if somebody is shot and killed by police, and it's on body camera, that, that's going to be great. Okay. It's going to be some good footage for the investigation. It's going to be good, good footage for the police and whatnot. But in terms of the public, if we want to access that, we'll, we'll never, we'll never see it. It's not the same as in the U S where in a lot of U S jurisdiction, if there's a police shooting, somebody's killed, it's caught on body camera, police service will release it within two, three days of that incident to kind of quell the unrest. Um, and to show that, oh, we're being transparent. Here's what happened. Right. And then, you know, all hell really breaks loose in that sense, because people are going to have their own opinions. Emotions are going to play into this in Canada. It's got to go through proper due process. If there's a video involved, yeah, privacy uh, constraints might, might even uh, provide obstacles in ever getting access to that video. And, and just generally down the road, when that video is released, if people are unhappy with the case in general, they're going to have a different kind of idea or perspective of that body camera footage anyway. And that's the whole problem with body camera footage. It's on the perspective of the police officer. It's not on the perspective of anybody else. So all we're seeing is what the officer is seeing in that interaction. And one video is going to produce multiple different interpretations. It doesn't matter who you're talking to. Somebody's going to have a different bias than you. They're going to see something different in that video. Somebody who watches the video 25 times is going to have a different uh, conception of that, of that event than somebody who watches it once. A lot of complexities that go into body cameras. They're expensive. Uh, there, there are privacy concerns with them, but they can also be very beneficial. They're good for evidence collection. They're good for, I guess, just generalizing an, an event and, and kind of helping maybe 
solve a certain certain issue. They, there are benefits to body cameras, but in terms of Canadian research, there just hasn't been very much. And the research that we have from other jurisdictions in terms of whether cameras are going to decrease or impact use of force and complaints, it's, it's quite mixed. Uh, some studies suggest that ca- uh, by use of force decreases after cameras. Some shows that it actually increases. Uh, one thing that it does show is that complaints do decrease after cameras are in there, which a lot of people think it's great, but we don't know why that's happening. We don't, there could be alternative explanations to why that's happening. One example I can give you is maybe people are, are more afraid to make a complaint against the police now. And that's something in my research that people have communicated that to me. I mean, they weren't very comfortable making a complaint before to the police. And with a body camera, they would feel further away from, from making a complaint because they're, they feel like they'd be further targeted. And going further, there's even jurisdictions that have put uh, public mischief charges in, in place. If somebody files a false complaint against the police and is caught on body camera, they could be charged. So, I mean, that's going to deter a lot of people from making a complaint that they might feel legitimate, but it, it turns out that it's unfounded anyway because most complaints against the police are unfounded because they're doing the investigation themselves. Um, but yeah, that's beside the point. Cameras... Uh, they can they can provide a lot of benefits, okay? But again, we don't have a research in Canada to suggest that they're going to just change everything automatically. They're very expensive tools. Uh, they're going to change a few things. They're going to kind of they they could change behaviors of of some people in some certain situations, but they're not going to change somebody who's having a mental health crisis. They're not just you know a body camera on scene is not going to automatically make that person stop being what stop doing what they're doing if they're if they're obviously having a crisis. So in that sense. We have to go beyond body cameras. We have to think about what are better, what, where's money going to be better spent to, to solve these issues or resolve some of these issues. And obviously body cameras, it's just one tool, but it's not going to, it's not going to cure all of this out there. I think I always like to use the, uh, an analogy of, you know, body cameras are a tool, one tool that can maybe help a little bit. When you look at, uh, when, when you need to hammer something into the wall, a nail, you're going to use a hammer. If you're going to clean, if you're going to clean snow off your car, are you going to use a hammer cleaning snow? No. So that's look at the, think about that as body cameras. Police need all these other resources to also help deal with certain issues in the community. Going beyond police, we also need to put better investment in our community support, mental health uh, organizations. All these support systems are better off with this money than than body cameras at the moment. Um, so that's something, especially when we have a defund the police movement that's going on quite you know globally right now. What does it tell the public when we're going to spend millions of dollars on, on this tool, but we're also asking for, for more money to be taken out of the police budget and put into community support, right? It doesn't, it doesn't blend. So there's something that uh, it's it just telling when, when people are, are very quickly, politicians and leaders are very quick to put money into this type of tool without really good research behind it, really good evidence-based research. And it's almost a slap in the face of the public uh, who, who really need that money to, in, in certain support systems. And it's just something that it's gonna, it's gonna play out over the next few years. But I, I just want obviously everyone to kind of think critically of body cameras. They, they, they might help in a lot of cases, but there's a lot of things that if you peel, peel layers back, there's a lot of problems with them as well that we, they might, there might be so many unintended consequences down the road that we don't even know yet with them. So we, it's almost a wait and see, and it's always a better approach to invest more money in the community at first. And if there's money left over, maybe we can we can think about investing in body cameras. That's probably the best uh, strategy for police in Canada to be dealing with right now. Um, and obviously, I can talk way more about these things, uh, but I've already been talking a lot, and I, 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 sometimes I just rant uh, a little bit. So I apologize for anybody who uh, who thinks that I've been ranting. But uh, just to close things out, uh, going back to use of force, there's a lot of, there's a lot of problems with just transparency and documenting categorizing use of force to begin with, it starts with having a really good uh, database, okay? We have to have a standardized database that works, you know, throughout the province, but throughout Canada. I mean, hopefully one day we'll have a good standardized database of use of force incidents, not just lethal force, but all use of force. So the public can access this, infor- this information and, and, and see trends, patterns, and problem, problematic areas, and we can address those problems. Um, and then just going forward, obviously, we always hear better training for police. They do go through a lot of training, but how effective is that training? How effective is the mental health training, the de-escalation training? We, they, you know, excuse of force skills are perishable. They need to be retrained every year. So obviously communication, that needs to be retrained every year. There needs to be, you know, a devoted time to doing mental health training at different points throughout the year. So officers are, are, are better equipped to deal with, with people out in, in, our, in our society who are having problems. And obviously looking at alternative responses to, to these problems as well is something that, that the future is gonna hopefully dictate and we'll, we'll move towards uh, and preventing death, that's for sure. Um, 
but uh, generally, I mean, there's so much more I can talk about. Obviously, limited time, I do want to get to the question and answer. So I, I will just leave it there. And hopefully, we'll be able to have some more of this discussion uh, in the question and answer. But thank you for listening to me. I appreciate it. And uh, looking forward to talking more uh, right now. OK, um, John, are you ready with your first question? Yes, thank you. Um, I actually had two um, after thinking about it. Uh, but I'll ask the, the first kind of one because I think uh, Eric is absolutely dead on in, in suggesting that A, the body-worn cameras, they're costly, and B, um, people shouldn't be 100% convinced that these aren't going to be used against them um, as opposed to just simply being accountability structure or, or accountability technologies for the police. Um, but maybe one way of sort of defunding the police or re reducing uh, cost, and, and I think we discussed this a little bit, Eric, but um, what would happen if we uh, took away uh, the uh, frontline police officers sidearms? for example, which is the UK model. The UK model, the frontline police officers generally do not carry firearms. What do you think about that? I think it's a discussion that we can have for sure. Um, do I think it's going to happen? And, and you know my answer to this, no, I don't think it will ever happen. Uh, a lot of people that I talked to from the community, that's one thing I was asked them, how can we decrease, decrease cases of excessive use of force or you know improve that area? And a lot of the members say, get rid of the guns from police officers. They don't need them. Um, look at the models over in Europe, like you, like you mentioned in the UK, they, the just community beat patrol officers do not wear, uh, do not have sidearms, they don't have firearms. Um, so it is something that, it's an interesting topic to, to discuss. Is it gonna decrease uh, use of force? No. Is it going to decrease police shootings? Possibly, but there's still police shootings in, in, in the UK. And even though most police officers don't have guns, it's just specialized units. So I still think the responses to a lot of the issues that we have in our community, it's going to be met with a specialized unit who have guns already. So I don't think, I mean, it's a discussion we should be having. But again, something that we had, John and I had discussed earlier is that uh, unions and police associations are going to would be 100% against this from ever happening. And, and it's just something that it, it's just, we won't see it in, in the future, even though it's something that we do need to discuss. And, you know, quite frankly, to get away from kind of that, or get, get into that disarming discussion uh, is something that it's neat, it's necessary, uh, especially in this day and age with with uh, defunding movement. But in terms of what, what would we replace them with? Well, they already have tasers. They already have other alternative weapons. So going back to is, would, it, would it improve anything? I think it will improve. It would improve some cases, but I don't think we would see a huge drop in use of force cases based on that. I still think that that would happen. Just the nature of the job, it requires that. And I'm sure a lot of police officers would, would agree. Great. I, I recognize my camera was off when I asked the question. I'm sorry about that. Um, and the last question I, I, I did ask you because it was a question that uh, has been asked for a very long time in Canada. People don't understand that a lot of these issues go back decades and decades and decades, and they've been looked at by uh, many scholars. Um, if Under what conditions should somebody file a complaint against the police? Uh, and uh, would you recommend, generally speaking, people file complaints against the police if they have reason to complain about? I'll preface it by saying I, I encourage everyone who has a legitimate complaint, they feel like they've been wronged by the police to complain. Um, that's your right. Uh, you, you can, you should do that in terms of whether it's going to, anything's going to come out of it. That's a different, that's a different question. That's going to be a different answer because from what we see, a lot of complaints are unfounded to begin with. So if somebody feels that they, that they have a legitimate complaint, they put it in, they go through the process of dealing with it. They're questioned by police officers uh, who are investigating the case. They, they might feel belittled. They might feel targeted. Who knows what they might feel. They might feel re-victimized even in that case. And then to come out and, and there is no basis for, for the allegation 
they're going to, it's going to feel terrible for that person. And they're going to lose a lot of trust in the system. So some, we might need to change the system. That is something we might need to change because we, we do have an oversight bodies who investigate complaints. Okay. We have in Ontario, it's the OIPRD in all the other provinces. It's a different type of complaints agency, but they oversee complaints that are made against the police. Now they don't do the investigations in most cases. They send the complaint back to the police service. The police service is going to do the investigation themselves. It's going to be the professional standards bureau within that, that local institution who's going to investigate themselves. There's been plenty of cases over just last year where somebody, an indigenous person, for example, has put in a complaint against the police. The, the, the police, for example, the RCMP show up, investigate, and they make they belittle them. They make them, but they bully them into almost dropping the complaint. So it's not a really good system that we have working, right? And it's something in Ontario that we're trying to change. We're trying to have independent investigators who are doing all these complaints. The problem is we don't have the resources. People put, uh, there's about 4,000, 3 to 4,000 complaints that are lodged in Ontario every year. That's a lot of, that's a lot of, that's a volume, okay? It's a lot of complaints to investigate. So we don't have investigators to, to be doing that work. So the easiest kind of streamline to do it is send it back to the police service. And this is consistent across most Western jurisdictions in, in the UK, in Australia, New Zealand, the police service will investigate themselves in those cases. And then they'll send it back to the oversight body to review the case to make sure everything was, was you know, spot on or whatnot. So I think we need to have a, a better system in terms of investigating complaints to have better trust in the system. And people will might feel more comfortable making complaints against the police if they feel like that they've been wrong by them. Thanks, Eric. We have a lot of great questions coming in. I'm just going to ask, uh, Crystal to quickly remind everybody how they can ask their questions. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So for those who have not been putting in their questions, I'll be real brief. If you just pretty much move your mouse or just swipe on your trackpad, it will come up where you can mute, um, stop your video, see uh, participants or just a Q&A bubble. It will look like a little text chat. It says Q&A. Uh, you can click that and type your question there. You can be anonymous with your questions. And if you want to come on screen and be seen like myself, Eric, and all the other panelists that are here, uh, you can just raise your hand and we will move you over onto this side. Uh, don't worry, uh, we will move you back. So we're not kicking you out of the Zoom just in case you think. We'll just get a notification and you'll be moving in between uh, the sphere. All right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Nelson. Back over to you. Thanks, Crystal. So our first question is from Jane. She says, thank you, Eric. You explain there's a lack of research and evidence around the use of body cameras. I'm wondering if the community members you've interviewed, specifically Indigenous and or Black people, expressed what they felt about police body camera use and whether they support or oppose their use. Yeah, well, that's a great question. Uh, yes, I, I asked those questions in, in, in talking to the people that I interview. Um, generally, it's mixed, to be honest with you. A lot of, a lot of the members think it, it, it will help in some cases, but they're so, uh, they're, they feel that it's not going to do much because officers are going to have the power to turn off or turn on the cameras. And that's something that's very debatable. You'll see it in the media quite often um, when it comes to policy direction for, for police officers and, and when they have to activate the cameras and, the, and they don't have to activate it. There's tons of cases in the U.S. where an officer for, forgot to, to turn the camera on and it's, it results in a death, right? And we missed that, that case because the, the camera wasn't turned on. So that exists. But a lot of the members that I talk to think that it's not going to do anything if officers have that power to turn it on, turn it off. So they are, they argue that they, they can have a, a meaningful impact if it has to be on the whole time, but that's a problem. And I don't, I don't communicate this with my participants because I want them to my, the community members, because I want them to speak freely. So there's a lot of privacy issues when it comes to the turn on, turn off function. Uh, John and I had discussed this earlier, but you know, something that people don't think about, you know, a police officer has to go to the washroom on their shift, right? They're going to have to be able to turn the camera off. They're, they're going to be speaking to, uh, you know, vulnerable populations, sometimes informants, sometimes uh, sexual assault victims. They might not want to be on video. So uh, the officers need kind of that, uh, the option to be able to turn it off. And if people don't want to be filmed, officers have to, you know, in most cases, respect that and turn it off, especially if it's in a private dwelling. So there's, there's a lot of complexities to the kind of the on off function, but it goes back to your question in terms of what the CUNY members think. It's a split, like I said, half of them don't think it's going to do anything. The other half think it could have a meaningful impact, but it all comes down to that, the, the discretion of the officer with turning it on, turning it off. 
Thanks. I have a question from Mary Louise. She asks, in what way do you think psychological profiles of persons entering a police force might help or not? I think that could be helpful for sure. I mean, a lot of a lot of research in this area suggests that you know, police officers from a diversified background who ha or who have, uh, you know, different types of personality traits are better off for the job. The problem with policing is that it attracts a certain segment of the population. Okay. And a lot of the times, a lot of these people don't have the emotional intelligence. They don't have the em empathy that, that is needed to deal with what we see going on currently in our society. So what happens is they get into this kind of mentality and especially it goes through training and it, it, there's a cultural impact that goes along with it. And you could have, you know, the cleanest background and the, 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 the perfect candidate to be a police officer. But once you're in the force, there's a lot of different factors that can kind of shift that and make changes. And if, if you don't make those changes that are necessary to fit in, it could push you out. There's a lot of people that I speak to uh, in, in, um, my research who have had cousins, family members who are, who are indigenous or black and, and they, they want to be police officers, but they're, they get in there and they're pushed out because there's racism within the police service against them. So it's not comfortable. It's not a safe space for a lot of these people. So I know we're trying to change this. Um, so I think to answer your question, I think psychological profiles and backgrounds of these people, uh, these candidates are extremely important. And I think a lot of this kind of exists within terms of vetting certain candidates for policing jobs. But it's just it doesn't it doesn't start and end at the at the door. I mean, it, it continues throughout their whole career through training, through supervisors and accountability mechanisms within the police service. If you don't have good leadership, then you're going to have a problematic police force in general. So, I mean, that's one part of kind of resolution to the problem. But there's a lot more that we have to do to really stamp out with the problems that we have right now. Right now, we have an on screen question from a fearless audience member. So, Tori James, over to you. Oh, here, just, yeah, you have to unmute. Uh, yep, right. figured that out. Oh, that was awfully nice of you to say. Um, Youngblood, I am so impressed with uh, your discussion tonight with the information that you've brought us. Um, uh, my name is uh, Buiha Bote, uh, Oneida Iroquois Confederacy. Uh, my government name is Tori James, and I'm known as such by all my good friends in my community at the University of Windsor. I'm seeing a disconnect here. Uh, you've done some wonderful research, well-needed research, but what I'm what I'm wondering about is um, you're not talking. You're not talking about the fact that we aren't dealing with the colonialized and frankly, and I'm, I know I'm not just talking about the United States, but Canada also, frankly, and I was in the Canadian Armed Forces for five years. I have uh, two young family members that are in police forces, one who just left the RCMP, not because of racism. Um, she left the RCMP because of the sexism. Um, we're not talking about the culture, the police culture, the culture of policing and the colonial connection to that. The fact that we're, we're talking about the idea, the very idea of policing um, in Turtle Island, on Turtle Island, in Canada, in the United States, in Mexico, that this all has come from, quite frankly, a very, I'm sorry, capitalist, colonial, racist view, which has been to advance and to protect capital. And I'm, I'm loving what you're saying. I'm understanding what you're saying. I agree with you. I think uh, spending money on, on um, body cameras, probably not going to make much of a difference at all. For instance, uh, you wouldn't know this, Eric, but a scan three years ago, three houses down from where I live on one side, there was a young man 
whose family immigrated from Baghdad uh, into Canada. And he was 28 years old. He clearly had what I would describe as PTSD. And three houses on the other side of me was a young family that had immigrated from from um, uh, Ecuador. And one day, the 28 year old took a hammer, probably some of you from Windsor will remember this, and the 13 year old boy from three houses on the other side of me from Ecuador was walking down the street and got hit in the hammer, hit in the head with a hammer. The police had been to that address seven or eight times. They're clearly, I don't expect police to have the skills to take care of that. They, they took the young man away. They put him in the um, um, psychiatric ward. Three days later, he gets kicked out as uh, you and I have seen and many of us have seen with family members and other people in, in our community. Uh, the police are not social workers. They did the best job they could, but they simply couldn't stop. Every single one of us in the neighborhood saw this coming. Even the police saw this coming, but there was nothing they could do about it. And all I'm, all I'm trying to say is defunding the police is actually not a bad idea. Not defunding and, and getting rid of police entirely. That would be crazy. But we have to talk about how we can augment the police. First of all, they have to, they gotta get better training when it comes to cultural sensitivity. We've got to help them. We've got to put the resources behind them so that they can police. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm so fed up with, uh, you know, we can't even, and I'm not even getting into stolen sisters and missing and, and murdered indigenous women and how we how that so-called that fake so-called um, um, what do they call that I'm sorry when when uh, you know they had the whole yeah. Tori Tori there's so much there and I'm, I think I'm gonna so that Eric has uh, the opportunity to address it I'm gonna ask him to stop me from carrying on <laughs> no. thank you well, thank no, you for thank, that yeah Thank you very much, Dory, for uh, for all of that great knowledge. I mean, I 100% I agree with you. And I think a, a conversation about just problems with policing in general is something that's 100% necessary to be having. Um, and it goes without saying everything that, that I discuss in my research, it, it all kind of falls under that guise of the problems that just the start that with policing. And just to get to point out something that you'd mentioned, uh, just the lack of just understanding and, and cultural sensitivity training, all of that, that we think that the police get and, and we think that you know, it's good because they're getting it, you know, how effective is it? It's not very effective at all. I can tell you an example from the RCMP. They just, uh, they have a new um, online kind of implicit, explicit bias training that literally is supposed to improve the understanding of, of problems that, that we've had historically with policing and, and Indigenous communities. And there's three paragraphs that talk about colonialism and the, and the Northwest Men of Police and kind of what they did to Indigenous communities back in the 18, 18, late 1870s. There's three paragraphs in this whole two-hour training session that are devoted just to that. So how problematic, you know, if we can't even understand the gravity of the problem, I mean, two hours alone wouldn't even be enough to tell all these, you know, Mounties, all the recruits, all the problems that go into this police service to begin with and the origins of this police service and what it's still doing in a lot of these communities. So this is, it's not going to do it. I mean, we have to be having serious conversations like you're talking about and, and probably having different alternative responses that don't include police to a lot of these issues because the police aren't equipped to deal with them. Thank you. Okay, another question here from Jason, and he asks, uh, investigating serious crimes, especially death and serious violence cases, requires a significant amount of criminal investigative exper expertise. In such case, if such cases are not investigated by people with such expertise, for example, ex-police officers, who do you suggest should conduct such investigations? Yeah, great question. And I, I'm I'm on I, I'm in the camp of of not dis 
disallowing police to be on these bodies, former police officers, because they do bring a great deal of experience and you need that experience. Now, what's wrong with having a, 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 a policing school a college of policing where investigators can be trained who have never been a police officer, who don't have that experience, who could be trained to deal with investigative techniques or, or to understand those types of uh, kind of nuances that go into those investigations. There's nothing stopping us from creating that and having actually civilian members who go through these, these uh, schools and, and whatnot and get those skills, acquire those skills and are equipped to deal with investigations of that nature. I think that's perfectly fine. I don't know why we can't do it. It's an investment, but it would probably bring more trust from the community in the sense of the investigations being done. Obviously there's always gotta be transparency in, in, in these cases, but in terms of having former police officers as investigators, I, I don't necessarily think it's a horrible thing, but I do think it says something about the trust and confidence that we have in the system because a lot of people don't, don't agree with it. So we have to kind of move away from that as, as best we can. A uh, great question here from Nick. He says, thanks for your illuminating talk. You've made a strong case about the need for data to bolster oversight. How do we as citizens ensure that oversight is effective? It's a great question. It's a hard one for me to answer uh, in obviously limited time, but I, I think we, we have to, we have to obviously ha be act active in the communities and in, in trying to get these these oversight bodies to to do what we want them to do i mean they're working for the public they're, they're they're accountable to the public we pay for them okay the taxpayers are paying for these organizations to be there their budgets are ballooning i mean the siu's budget's like 10 million dollars a year that's more than half of the police or small police services in ontario alone so they have huge budgets now, how can we make sure they're being effective about what they're doing? I mean, they have to be transparent to the public. They have to be engaging to the public. They have to want to reach out, inform, educate, have everyone be part of the process to, to see what goes into to these investigations. There's always a way to balance the privacy of people who are involved with what you actually do. I mean, you can do it. There's no, there's, it's not that hard. It's not that difficult. As long as you're following certain, obviously legislation and that you're fine. But in terms of, you know, going out to the communities, going out to minority communities, marginalized communities, educating them okay educating them on on what they do what they're there for they're they're accountable to the people and they're making sure that everyone is understanding of what goes on i think that's one way that we can keep these oversight agencies accountable and obviously making them to making them collect this data that they have and then releasing it publicly is something that's very important as well okay larry asks for better st statistics on police use of force who should be working to improve this information is this the responsibility of cities provinces or the federal government good question everyone is part everyone has to be part of it in terms of federal they're only looking at the rcmp so there's no way that they can mandate uh, agent, local agencies to collect information and report it because they don't have that jurisdiction. It's a provincial and territorial matter, which is policing, right? So they can only govern the RCMP. However, there can be strong communication and collaboration between provinces and territories to have a standardized database that works. So it can be engineered quite, quite easily as long as everyone's collecting this information at, consistently. And that's, that's all you need to do is uh, document it, report it, collect it consistently. And then it can go into a database that can be either stationed in each province or it can be a national database. I mean, there's nothing that's stopping that. If I, I'm myself, I can collect use of, uh, use of lethal force data. I'm not, there's nothing special about me, but I can collect that information. So nothing stopping from, from the provincial and territorial governments from doing the same and having much better data collection tools in place for that as well. So I think it's a mass collaboration between all these parties, but it really starts with having strong legislative uh, legislation in place to be to dictate and inform and instruct services to report consistently and document properly the use of force. And I think it kind of starts with that, but everyone needs to be a part of it. I just want to squeeze in a couple, uh, one more question. Um, uh, Claire asks about whether or not body worn cameras could be public access. Uh, probably not. Um, there's, there's problems with it because, uh, just to go, I mean, you can go and get a uh, body camera footage if you put an FOI in. You're probably not going to get most of the footage. And if you do get some of the footage, it's going to be heavily redacted. It really depends on the local policy. That's, that's the thing. If the police service makes their own policy on body cameras, which they have to do, and it's it's made public, which it should be, not all cases, it, is, it isn't. It will dictate or it will instruct community members, community members if they want to get access to footage that have to go through the proper channels to get that access. And it, trust me, in my in my experience of going through an FOI, a Freedom of Information request for certain information, it can take years to get that information and it can cost a lot of money. 
and it's 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 a deterrent method of of organizations to do that to make you go through all these hoops to get it. So in terms of can we make it private private uh, or public access? Possibly down the road, but I, I just don't see it in the future because we don't even know the landscape of body cameras in Canada to begin with. We don't we don't even know how well they're going to start working to let alone if they're going to be made public access. Obviously, if they go through the court system and there's a case that will be made public access. But even then, there could be privacy concerns that would redact some of that footage or blur out some of that footage. So there's a lot of discussion we have to have going forward in terms of kind of privacy, public access, transparency, everything goes into it. I'm just going to ask one last question of my own, which is, I, you know, I do feel there must be a lot of police that it's very important to them that the police force is reformed because if there's, you know, their colleagues are, you know, acting out or being violent, that's a threat to them as well. Um, but I'm wondering, uh, what do you want to see the public do in terms of, you know, you're very focused on isolating the problems and being very proactive about solutions. So what would you like to see citizens do to, you know, do what they can to improve, improve the situation? Yeah, 100% agree with, you know, there's a lot of great police officers out there. I don't, I, 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 I speak with them daily in my work. And I think, uh, I think most of them want to be part of that solution. They want to work towards that change. And a lot of times they do want to get in, they get into policing for the right reasons. It's just, we depend on police for too many problems in our society that they can't deal with. And that's, a, that's something that they can't fix. And they're never going to be able to fix as hard as they want to try. So in terms of how the public, what, what we need from the public, we need public to educate ourselves. We need everyone to educate ourselves on kind of what is out there and we're seeing it. I mean, we're seeing these kind of global shifts and global changes with people educating themselves, being part of something, you know, whether it's calling for defunding police or abolishing police or making changes to police and, and having mental health workers kind of deal with a lot of these responses. We're seeing these changes and, and it's a big wave. And, and I think if we continue to be active in that sense and keep educating ourselves on the problems that exist and being critical about those problems, especially when it comes to body cameras, because that's an expensive tool that we're going to have to pay. And we lend, again, we can have better money spent on things that that's going to help the communities in the long run. And I just feel that if, if everyone is educating themselves on these issues, being, being uh, engaging with what they can engage with, being active in, in, in these different movements and, and just, you know, trying to make change happen through, through these, these, these big movements and actions, I think that's going to start rolling the ball and making the changes necessary and just keep putting pressure on government agencies because that's who make those changes. It's not the police per se, it's the government that does it. So your provincial government, your territorial government, the federal government, it's, it's really kind of putting pressure on them to make those changes that happen and meaningful in the community. Great. Well, thank you so much for that and for joining us tonight. Um, before we go, I want to say a big thanks to Brent Lee for doing the music for, for the HRG's online events. Huge thanks as ever to Yvonne Zimmerman and Crystal Bryan. Thanks to our guest introducer, Dr. Duke Medjian. Uh, also a huge thanks to Dean Marcello Guarini and the Dean's Office who supports the HRG. I want to also say thanks to Tori James for asking those really important questions. It was a really important topic to be brought into the discussion. So thank you so much. And thanks to you, Eric, for coming out and doing the talk tonight. It's really exciting to hear from a young scholar who's near the end of his PhD and putting so much uh, attention and work into advocacy and, and getting your message out there. And it's really been wonderful to hear from you tonight. Thank you very much, Kim. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. And I hope everyone, I mean, if, if anybody wants to ask me questions, you can find my email online somewhere. Feel free to send me an email. I'm always happy to, to engage. So thank you for everyone for, for tuning in. Appreciate it.